This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 454, recorded on August 11th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. You just came in from the outside, right? I did. Tell me the weather. It's humid and hot and muggy. It's about 85 perhaps degrees, and it's about 60 to 70 percent humid humidity. According to my what does measurement it say? here, it's just 27 Celsius. It's almost 28, which is almost 82. Okay. A little bit low off. 80s. A little bit off. Humid New York it's City day. Humid. August, the dog days of August. Right here. Arf, arf. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And the temperature here is exactly palindromic. It's 82 <laughs> Fahrenheit, 28 C. <laughs> and, uh, Love it. And, and it's actually not that humid up here. Really? Um, I guess you all are in the, the moist air mass and right. we're in the... The drier one. The moist air mass. That just 41%. doesn't sound right. <laughs> you know, you get what you deserve. In the- <laughs> well, that's that's what it is. Also, you're. I mean, you're in the city, so you're on the, the urban heat island. Yeah, effect. that's just true. So joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. I've checked three temperatures. The range is from <laughs> 75 to 82. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to find the humidity, but... Uh, let's see, 57% humidity. It's not too bad. We have today for our August listening pleasure, we have two returning guests to TWIV. They are both from Florida Gulf Coast University. Please, everyone, join me in welcoming <laughs> Sharon, Sharon Eser, and welcome back, Sharon. Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. And Scott Michael. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having us. So how about a weather report? Um, so it is a little warmer down here, yes. 89 Fahrenheit. Um, how do you convert that um, to, um, let's see, 32 Celsius or blue blazes? It's pretty hot. Um, yeah. 69% humidity uh, and only a 20% chance of rain today. Uh, uh. Are you in a drought situation? Um, it's been raining a lot in the afternoons on uh. and off. So it rains hard and puddles and, and goes away. But right now we're hot. Because I know that the Everglades occasionally gets into a drought situation, and then you get fires. Mm, no, we're in the rainy season right now, so it'll oh, okay. be dry um, after, after 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 New Year. So the skeeters are starting to come out? Oh, the skeeters are bad. <laughs> they were bad where we were. Vincent and I were out in Hamilton, Montana, at a meeting, and, and then I went fishing afterwards. Vincent went home, and I could not get out of my car. Oh, I am not kidding. Were they, got a, bad. were they hitting the windshield? They were no, no. They were just sitting out there waiting. You didn't you <laughs> see them, and then you open the door, and then they just <laughs> killed you. They just so I, yeah. At Dixon and I went to uh, Hamilton, Montana. We were at a meeting. You can see last week's TWIV is up. Yep. It's very nice, yep. Dixon. Yeah, and um, it was a two-day meeting, and the second day, Dixon and I played hooky. We, a hooky, quite Dick, literally. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, very good. I didn't do that. <laughs> That's good. Uh, and Dixon took me on a float down the Bitterroot River. No, no. Oh, yeah. The, nice. The West Fork of the Bitterroot River. All right. Mm. Isn't it still the Bitterroot River? Well, it's not quite the main stem. Have, have either of you been, Sharon or Scott, have ever you been to the Bitterroot? Uh, yes. We've been to Hamilton. I think, yeah, we've been in that yeah, neighborhood. Good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. So, um, it's right close to the uh, Rocky Mountain Labs. That's right. That's, that's where, where, we where the meeting was. And yeah. uh, Dixon. Dis- so Dixon had been there for 10 days before and 10 days afterward right. fishing. So he took me on a float. And I must say, it was it was amazing. It was beautiful. It was lovely weather. The fish, Dixon is an expert. <laughs> we've heard him talk about fishing, but I have seen it. And now, the guy was amazing. He could put that lure anywhere he wanted it in the stream. It would touch the water, and bingo, the trout would come. There you go. <laughs> so you'd say he's pretty fly. He's pretty fly. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive. And I videotaped the entire thing, so one of these days I'll release it. In fact, I'm super fly. <laughs> no, uh, the, the, we, he caught browns. Did you caught a browns? A cutthroat and rainbow. Yeah. All, all Beautiful. 
Yep. And the biggest one, 20 or so inches, right? That's nice. the one we didn't, you didn't pull in. <laughs> no, but we did get good looks at it, though. It was a good Now, are those, are those all wild, or yes. are they stocked? No, no. No stocking at all there. Okay. They had an original stocking, but then they didn't stock. They haven't stocked that river in years. And he, oh, put, wow. them, he put them all back, of course, immediately. Absolutely. Right. Once we looked at them. Yep. We would, Admired Dixon, their actually, beauty. You kissed one of them, the, the first one. Right? I not only kissed them, I licked my fingers afterwards because I, you know, I want to connect with the fish. I want to apologize for being so mean to them because I'm just having a little fun. I'm not sure it's fun for them, but it's certainly fun for me. I wonder as what you they're saw. thinking. I wonder what they're, they're not thinking. You know, you put them back together. What the hell was that? That's the worst fly <laughs> I ever it, ate. When a giant <laughs> ape hauls them out of the water yeah, and know, brings know, them know. toward its mouth, Tell me I don't it. think they're, they're thinking that that's something fun. No, they're not. I, I'm sure. Uh, Sharon or, and Scott, do you either of you fish? I've done a little bit, but I'm not very successful at it. Um, we went out on a boat with our lab group to look for some uh, ladyfish. Um, one of our oh, yeah. students, her dad had a boat, and um, it was a, a little competition, um, all women <laughs> crew. And we didn't catch much, so we didn't have good success with the ladyfish competition. What's a ladyfish? Um. They're not that pretty looking, actually. Um, <laughs> they're long, silver fish. I, I, we didn't catch any, so, um, yeah. yeah, they're not, uh, kind of nondescript in my opinion. Yeah, you're right. Almost like a mullet. Well, this yeah, is, they didn't look like much. This is actually um, not this week in trout, but. No. Right. So we're going to talk about viruses, but I wanted to say the, the number of this episode is 454, and uh, those of you, some of you may remember a company called 454 Life Sciences. Sure. or mm -hmm. It's a company founded. Uh, by Jonathan Rothberg, who wanted to sequence the genome of his daughter, I think uh, the folklore goes. And he figured out a new way to sequence, which was totally revolutionary and could do a lot in one day. He called it the 454 Corporation, which was subsequently bought by Roche. And then, uh, listen to this, they, Roche bought them in 2007 for $155 million. Today, that would be a billion, I bet. <gasps> Because nothing right. sells for 150. Right. Anyway, uh, it no longer exists. But it was the first. When we say next generation sequencing or deep sequencing, this was the first four five four. Wow! Mm -hmm. So this is episode four five four. We're going to get through deep. it in, in no time. <laughs> this is a deep viral sequencing <laughs> show. <laughs> have, We're have, actually going to talk about six papers simultaneously. We'll all be talking at the same time. Yeah. And then listeners <laughs> listeners can piece the episode together later. Oh, it's it exactly be, what it works. We'll, right. we'll be contigs. We'll be contigs. That's exactly how it works. I can say one word. You could say another. And just randomly. Huey, Louie, and Dewey. We could do that. That would be funny. <laughs> anyway, I thought we had to give homage. Each of our TWIV episode numbers has some special significance. And this is one of them. 440 was a, a, a car. Right. right. Oh, it's, it's also an A. And, mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> All right. So Sharon and Scott have published a few papers recently, which we thought we would have them come and talk about. And they all have to do with uh, Zika. I was going to ask both of you, have you completely switched to Zika or you're still pursuing some dengue in your laboratories? We're still working on dengue, yeah. We're mostly, would you say? Mostly dengue? Um, combination. I think we're, we're still doing both. Same with you, Scott? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, dengue is, is still a problem. And uh, just because Zika stole the spotlight for a little while doesn't mean that uh, dengue's gone away. Hmm. All right. Okay, so first of all, give us an update. What's going on with Zika? Can either of you tell us? I put a little link to this cool Pan American Health Oh, because that's perfect. Yeah, sure, Sharon, do you want me to take this one? or uh, Sure, you want to go ahead and start, and I, I'll fill in the blanks. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> He'll correct you. He'll correct you. <laughs> right. <laughs> by, by the way, just, uh, we're married. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you are uh, absolutely correct here. Um, well, Zika, and, and I'm looking at exactly that same page. This is the PAHO uh, Zika epidemiological update from the 26th of July, 2017. Right. Right. And um, the, the basic story is uh, Zika is, is dwindling down um, hugely compared to last year. In most places, the, the case numbers are a, a tenth of what they were in 2016 at the peak. And... Um, there are a few countries that seem to miss the um, the 2016 outbreak. Uh, Argentina, uh, Bolivia, uh, let's see, Peru in particular, just some noteworthy ones. And they seem to be having more cases this year uh, than they did last year because they didn't really have much of an outbreak last year. But um, Brazil, for example, Brazil is down um, 
more than tenfold compared to the same time last year. And the same thing in Florida here. Uh, we don't have any local cases at all to report sure. in Florida. Um, and whereas this time last year, how many did we have, Sharon? Do you got that? Do you have that number? Yeah, we had for this week last year, we had 17 uh, local transmission cases. And travel-related, we were at 381, and this year there are only 97 travel-related cases. And again, like Scott said, zero local transmission in Florida. Wow. So is your state's uh, Department of Public Health doing any surveys of ADs for yes. the virus? Yeah, so absolutely. So is the virus still around? Um, no, the virus is so – they're still screening. Um, they have about 200 BD traps out there collecting mosquitoes, and, and these are collected and sent off to, to a lab here in Florida where they're looking for um, Zika, dengue, and, yeah. and other viruses transmitted by mosquitoes. And so far, as far as from the last time I talked to um, the group at Miami-Dade Mosquito Control, they had nothing to report as far as um, – a positive Zika mosquitoes in the area. So they're still screening. There's there's surveillance. Um, every time they get a traveler coming back to Miami-Dade, for example, the mosquito control will go th around their neighborhood and places of business and treat those areas for mosquitoes just to make sure that new right. cases are not, you know, the, the, the cycle doesn't start again. You mean a traveler who tests positive for Zika? Right, a traveler that comes right. back right <laughs> is positive for Zika. What did I say? I probably said something. You said every time a traveler comes back to Miami Dade. Oh yeah, that would be would really be chaotic. <laughs> 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 wow. Yeah, no. Every time a positive Zika case comes back, oh. those uh, individuals are um, their their uh, neighborhoods are, are looked at carefully. So and how long is a person so if a person comes back diagnosed with Zika? How how um, long do they remain viremic before they can't transmit it? Um, that depends on the individual. I mean, maybe a couple of weeks, one, okay. two weeks, something like that. Right. How does that compare with dengue? It's probably about the same. About the same. And West Nile is about the same too, I guess. And all these flabbies seem to fall into that category. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Zika, Zika is a little funny though because um, you can uh, you you clear it out of your bloodstream, so it's gone from your your blood. But a lot of people enough. continue to have viremia in their urine or um, in their semen or you know yeah. what have you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now something weird has been going on with the congenital syndrome too, right? It seems like it's very inconsistent. Right. They, uh, some some countries have had like they're initially. When the first outbreak happened, I remember there was this huge concern about microcephaly, and that was in Brazil, and other countries have not quite seen the same linkage, or sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. What's what's going on? Uh, yeah, I think um, Brazil had a huge number of microcephaly cases um, compared to the number of, of reported Zika cases, and other countries right. haven't reported that that many. Um, I think there there might either be something going on um, that's uh, predisposing people in certain areas, um, or you know the, these microcephaly cases are actually fairly rare compared to the number of uh, right. number of, of total infections. So it might just be a reporting sort of a thing. Right. And there are lots of causes for microcephaly, so they sure. have to rule out all the other things, mm -hmm. too. Then. Sure, right. Noticing on this page, Peru had a big spike this year. Does it say where in Peru? Mm, where you were. <laughs> well, I mean, it's all I over. There we go. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't say. No, yeah. it just uh, last year, there was a little bit at the end of the year, mm -hmm. and then a big spike in uh, starting at about week 13, it looks like. Hmm. And I they mean, had not previously yeah. gotten it as far as the records go. And also a spike in Ecuador, Bolivia, a little bit, and as, as you said, Argentina. Mm. You so know, that's the text down below says where in Peru, at first primarily in the Department of Loreto, and then Cajamarca, Ica, La, La, La Beritad, Lima, Piura, and Tumbes. Mm. Were you in any of those? I was in Lima. <laughs> I'm sure I was in some of the other places too, but I was just trying to see if it was a lowland, right, right. tropical transmission or if it was in the highlands as well. So having heard those names, you don't know. No, I don't. I, we never went to them by regions. Okay. We went to them by cities. Well, this is a problem, of course, for vaccine testing because many, many vaccines are being developed. We heard some of those at the meeting. We did. By the way, it was... Tom Monath, right? Yeah. Do you remember him? He's your old Do player. I remember him? <laughs> Dixon actually, <laughs> uh, we pulled up to the hotel on Sunday. He goes, I know that guy. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> anyway, right. he gave a great talk on he that. He did. 
economics of me. It turns out it's very expensive because the virus titer is quite low. Uh. And to grow them on Vero's, they have to grow them on glass beads, which are very difficult to scale up to hundreds of liters. And yeah. the cost for a big batch is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. It's really not just, yeah, we'll make a vaccine and it's out there. Right. So it's uh, going to be, of course, with so few cases, it's hard to test. Right. So that'll be difficult. We'll see what happens. Now, uh, Sharon and Scott, you have published three papers recently, and I thought we would chat a little bit about them. Uh, you have two which are na- uh, letters to nature uh, with hmm. with a the world's population of authors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen, I've like seen a more. Physics papers. Physics papers have even more. Yeah. Those go on forever. <laughs> but there are quite a few here. And um, you're both on these. And one of them is called Zika virus evolution and spread in the Americas. And uh, the other is called genomic epidemiology reveals multiple introductions of Zika virus in the United States. And that one has one, two, three, nine. four, five, six, <laughs> seven, eight, nine co- <laughs> First authors, which I've never seen before. And then, of course, we have Scott and Sharon there. So maybe you could tell us um, what you did for these papers and what they mean. Sure, yeah. This was, as as you pointed out, a, a huge collaborative effort. Um, various groups interested in, in answering some the s- similar questions. And, and in, um, instead of competing with each other, we just decided, you know, the this is Zika. We want to find out what's going on, especially with all the cases of microcephaly. We wanted to really understand and 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 map how the virus was spreading. And so, just to give you our perspective of, of how we sort of joined and started the, this effort, we've been, as you know, here at Florida Gulf Coast University. I guess we're starting our 14th year now, and we've been working um, with local Florida mosquito control districts on different outbreaks. In the past, we've worked with uh, dengue virus outbreaks in Key West, Florida back in 2009, 2010, and then more recently with dengue in Port St. Lucie in 2013. And so we've been, you know, so when Zika um, started to come up, the Americas, Miami-Dade Mosquito Control approached us and said, hey, you know, you've helped us screen mosquitoes in the past for um, dengue and chikungunya, would you, are you set up and ready to help us maybe with uh, what's going on with Zika? And so we just said, yeah, we're, we're ready to go whenever you guys are ready to ship mosquito pools, we're, we're, we're ready. And so that's how it started with us getting mosquito samples. We also work closely with the Florida Department of Health um, to, um, with, in particular, their Tampa lab. Um, to gain access to clinical samples of Zika-infected individuals from both travelers and uh, local uh, transmission in Florida. And so we very quickly started processing these samples, and we reached out to um, um, collaborators, figuring out, well, you know, in the past we sort of farmed out our sequencing. We just, you know, cloned our, our or just sent out our samples out to um, um, different companies and just kind of fee-for-service got our sequences back. But we knew because of the scale and the magnitude of the problem, we wanted to do this quickly. We wanted to do it well. We wanted to do it right. And so we reached out to a collaborator, Bob Gary, over at Tulane. And he said, well, let me put you in touch with two excellent groups, um, <laughs> Pardee Sabeti's group at um, the Broad Institute and Christian Anderson, who's over at Scripps in La Jolla. And we just started talking, you know, here we have access to samples. We want to screen them quickly. Are you guys in? And they were very interested in the process of this. Um, um, the um, Pardee's lab was also looking at other locations in the Americas, and we were particularly focused in Florida. And then Gustavo Palacios from um, uh, US Emirate was already starting to look at things going on in Miami. And so we just, you know, decided to let's all get together, um, share samples, um, put sequences out before pre-publication. We had things out on GenBank. We had things out on websites. We also um, pre-published in um, bioarchives these papers and eventually led to the um, Nature publication. Once our data was available out there, a lot of people started looking at it saying, hey, I want to be able to try this with it. What about analyzing that? And we had a lot of people doing bioinformatics who jumped in um, and, you know, with expertise and things that we, you know, weren't quite ready to do ourselves. And so this is, like I said, a huge effort. Lots of minds went into it. A lot of people excited about it just to try to answer some of the basic questions of Zika spread in the Americas. I think the last time you were on TWIV, October 2016, you were just starting the screening. Is that right? Because I think you didn't have any positive pools yet. Is that right? 
We had, let's see, back then we, we already had some samples available. I think we did have positive yeah. pools. Yeah, I think I have to go back. The first positive pool was in August okay. 22nd um, of last year, okay. mosquito pool. Yeah. And since then you had more? We had eight yeah. positive mosquito pools between the 22nd and October 5th. So in this one paper, so the two papers, one is U.S. introduction and the other is kind of a global evolutionary look in the Americas. Mm-hmm. One paper, they say mm-hmm. 24,351 mosquitoes. Is that you guys? <laughs> we started that effort. Eventually, um, Florida Department of Agriculture um, started up a lab to test all of the different locations um, in Florida. So it's just sort of centralized the testing. But mm-hmm. we did um, up front, I um, uh, forget exactly, probably well into August or so. And then around mid-August, it switched out. So it was Florida Department of, of mm-hmm. Agriculture, but it was a combination between the two. This year, um, the Florida Department of Agriculture's lab is is doing all the screening for mosquitoes. Mm. It says here, eight pools of less than 50 mosquitoes. So that's what you were referring to, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one out of 1,600 mosquitoes were infected. Mm-hmm. So if you only get bitten once, you have a pretty good chance of not being infected. <laughs> You're probably yes. going to be okay, yes. <laughs> but typically you get bitten a lot, though, right? Yeah, try try to go to Florida and only get bitten by one mosquito. <laughs> if you're having dinner outside or having a drink or having a smoke outside, chances are you're going to get a few mosquito bites. So, yeah, not just the one. Well, in, in Hamilton, Dixon and I, one night, were sitting by a pond. and Which wasn't smart. He started <laughs> slapping himself, and I said, well, I never get bitten. And he said, what's that? Yeah, and right. So we went inside. <laughs> But those are not 80s. No. Those are Cubicines. Well, they might have been. They, they could have been AU's Vexans because they're a late afternoon biter. And they were vexing you. And they were, that's why they were they're named. Vexing. That's the exactly name. why they were named. That. So, uh, Scott, do you feel always plugged into this project or did you feel like you gave them something and you didn't hear for a long time? Um, in terms of sending samples off to uh, yeah. get sequenced, yeah. no, it was really collaborative and really tight. Um, mm. We had weekly uh, video meetings on Zoom. Um, <laughs> yeah, all of the the whole collaboration came together really, really nicely. And um, we uh, something that Pardis says all the time is um, roots, not parachutes. You know, if if you're going to yeah. go do this sort of a thing and do it as a group, you you all get into it and you give credit to everybody and um, you you make it. Not just coming in and fixing the problem and then going away again. You you get the whole group into it, and and everyone was was great. I've heard it said another way: pa- uh, partnerships, not parachutes. That's another way of saying it. Yeah. Don't yeah. just go in and get your samples. So tell tell us about the multiple introductions of Zika. What's the bottom line there? Well. Um, what we what we ended up doing is you know making a phylogenetic tree both um, maximum likelihood sort of a thing as well as um, uh, molecular clock based trees but um, what what you could do is you could definitely pick out groups of viruses that had arrived in Florida separately mm. and and where it's not always clear, but we found at least four different groups of, of Zika viruses that uh, we think had arrived um, either in Florida and then diversified in Florida into quite different groups or uh, had arrived from different introduction events. And when we went and did uh, some additional analysis, some some basic epidemiological um, calculations, it suggested that with our R values, which were low, um, we probably had multiple introductions, maybe as many as 40. We just didn't sample all of those in terms of getting a sequence. So the epidemiological um, data suggested that we had multiple, and, and we did. We found at least four of these and sequenced them, and most of them seemed to be coming from a Caribbean source. But since there's not really good surveillance in the Caribbean, it was really hard to tell where it was coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, probably not Puerto Rico, but it might have been the Dominican Republic. Right. Um, it may have been some other islands as well. It, it's hard to tell. Jamaica was in there as well. And then one of the introductions um, was also looked like it was um, – linked molecularly to viruses that were circulating in Central America. So we just got bombarded here, and I think that's probably what happened across the Caribbean and a lot of places once this virus broke out of Brazil. And that's kind of, uh, I mean, that's kind of what you might expect given how closely connected this whole region is, right? 
Absolutely. And especially with travel, um, you've got right. people flying on planes back and forth. You've got cruise ships going in and out. You've got all sorts of stuff. So uh, the, the viruses are, are coming. And with the number of travel-related cases in the hundreds, you know, you have to expect that probably more than one of those is going gonna, is gonna to break out and, and cause an outbreak. Right. Mm-hmm. I think you so say, the, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just going to say that the the major sites, so where we found positive mosquitoes were in the Miami Beach area in, in, in Miami. And um, it was interesting that in one particular trap, we uh, spaced about a month apart, we found two mosquito pools that were positive for Zika and they were from two different um, groups. So different lineages mm. within the same geographical area. So there was co-circulation, at least of two of these clades within the same Miami Beach area. Was that trap like near a port or an airport or something or just um, uh, by a it golf was, course? By a golf me, course. I can okay. double check on that. I have the GPS coordinates. Um, <laughs> the <street laughs> no, no, address for you. <laughs> I was just wondering if there was some obvious. Um, <laughs> Did you want to no, come it's, and it's, visit? It's, 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 uh, it's no. <laughs> Miami Beach. It's, it's going to be out there. It's in, in the city there, Miami Beach. Right. Yeah. So what was when? Do, I know in this paper you made some estimates. When did this? first come in? What was the earliest possible time? So the first reported um, local transmitted case in in people was in July, and the estimates look like it was earlier that spring that Zika came to Florida. So maybe, I don't know what, Mm -hmm. April, something, maybe a little earlier. A couple of months before the first. uh, Yeah, maybe up to four or six months. Interesting. Are they doing any follow-up with regards to seropositivity in in the local neighborhoods to see whether or not there's something like herd immunity that's preventing further outbreaks or something like that? That's a really good question. I am, I'm not aware of any studies involving that. I don't know. I mean, why do you think that the transmission is down this year? Um, I think just as we were looking at just what's going on globally in the Americas, there's, there's less of an incidence of Zika in, in the countries that mm-hmm. – you know, most people here in the States travel too. And so there's, there's less of a, they're not getting as infected. So the chances of them coming home with Zika are less. Yeah. So for, right. do you think they've stepped up their control programs for the mosquitoes then? And that explains um, some of this? Yeah. Where exactly? So I, I know in Miami Dade, yes, for sure. That's, they're being very vigilant. I'm not aware of, or I'm not really sure what's going on. In, in other countries. The 80s is not too difficult to, to control because it's a tree hole breeder, but it breeds in these uh, standing water containers and peri-domestic regions. So, I mean, that's how they built the yeah. Panama Canal. But so everybody knows those stories. So I'd expect there to be tremendous variation. Yeah. Well, maybe you see I mean, it in I, Peru I could and imagine, Ecuador. And, I could imagine rigorous efforts in, you know, San Juan, but maybe sure. not so much in Haiti. Well, or, or uh, in Bolivia or in other or, places. Yeah. That's right. So, well, they say in this paper that the use of insecticides in Florida probably contributed to clearance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, they yeah. made it knocked it down below the transmission. Yeah. Level. Yeah. We, we actually have some good data in, in the publication that shows that, that mosquito levels, mosquito abundance actually does drop with the application of pesticides. And um, yeah, so I think we can say pretty clearly that mosquito control did a great job. Mm-hmm. Dixon, the last sentence of this paper, and, and with respect to your, your question, we expect that outbreaks in Florida will cycle with Zika transmission dynamics in the Americas, because it's not going to be... Right. It'll uh, be imported cases rather than autochthonous cases. Yeah, it's not going to be sustained in Florida. Exactly. That that's, that's a big question, though, and that's one of the things that we were really thinking about this year is... Mm-hmm. is were the uh, were the same lineages of viruses going to spring back up again? Because these uh, these viruses can be transmitted transovarially, and those eggs can survive through the winter easily in Florida. And so we didn't really have any idea if we were going to see the same lineages popping back up again. Interesting question. But without any local transmission, I guess it's a moot point. Mm. So, do you, are, are either of you aware of any isolations of Zika this summer from mosquitoes in the same area? No, I don't, I don't think there have been any. No. Been any? Yeah. Wow. No. Interesting. Okay. Anything else from that paper that we should touch on? Oh, I, one thing I wanted to bring up is very interesting. Ha- over half of the travelers into Miami uh, during this certain period, January to June 2016, came from the Caribbean. Over half. Mm-hmm. It's a popular destination. Yes, very. So well, and it's uh, it's hard to book a flight to the Caribbean without going through Miami, right? 
<laughs> right. Well, you can just book it through uh, Dove Airlines. <laughs> well, yeah. <I> just... <laughs> <laughs> That's clandestine airline, please. <laughs> no, but it's it's such yeah. a hub. Yeah, um, yeah, South sure. Florida is, is a real. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's a hub for airline flights. It's a hub for cruises. And right. um, yeah, yeah cruise, lots of travel. Cruise, yeah. The cruises, especially. You can't get a cruise out of New York City to the Caribbean, right? You have to go to Florida. Or maybe I'm wrong. Someone will write a letter. <laughs> <laughs> and we will read it. <laughs> All right. The other paper is a broader look, right? Yeah, and there's actually a, a third paper as well by a group, uh, Faria et al., and that was mostly done in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And um, that that paper um, described the outbreak in Brazil really nicely. Right. And then our, our first paper described the outbreak in Florida, which was substantially smaller. And then there's a there's a there's this other paper that's um, Metzke et al., uh, that, that kind of ties both of those together and talks a lot about the the details of sequencing and what we discovered from the sequences. This one only has four co-first authors. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> So Sorry. Th this one, they looked at 110 genomes. I guess these were new sequences that they got, right? Mm -hmm. From 10 mm -hmm. countries. And and then they put that in the context of, context of all the sequences that are available, right? To make these uh, these trees and so forth. Right. And that, I think one of the interesting things that I found from this is that early 2014, uh, is the probably earliest ancestor in Brazil. Although possibly late 13. Yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So it, it could have been <laughs> it could have been a long time there, yeah. Before anyone noticed. So, you know, they say in the beginning, this is this underscores the importance of surveillance. Well, I, you know, if you don't know what to look for, exactly. it's hard, right? Well, yeah. And people have said, well, we can't find everything, so I don't know what you can do until you start seeing it rise above the, the noise. Microsoft level. doing something or, uh, what oh, was yeah. the company that we, was, we had Microsoft on it. Right, uh, those guys right. doing trapping mosquitoes, uh, yeah. by, by drone, right? One at a time. I think the hope, what? um, that's been driven a lot by the, the Silicon Valley folks who are into big data, um, is that if you, if you do monitor and sequence everything and just accumulate these data that you'll be able to detect trends that wouldn't have been apparent otherwise. Right. I don't know if that's actually feasible, but that's, I think that's kind of the rationale going on there. Yeah. And it's in this paper that Sharon and Scott are on that says that they revealed, uh, 41 likely novel viral sequences, sequence fragments in the mosquito pools. Mm. Yeah, that's it. So, Go ahead. Yeah, that that's actually one of the things that that I was most interested in, and um, mm -hmm. but we got shoved by uh, the reviewers back into the supplemental. But um, <laughs> yeah, we in in the mosquitoes, and and you know these are just the mosquitoes that were caught that were positive for Zika. There are a whole bunch of other viruses, lots and lots of other things, and we got snippets of all sorts of crazy little viruses, and then we got full genomes of a variety of different self-fusing agents and um, deformed wing viruses. There's a there's a bunch of stuff in these in these wow. mosquitoes uh, that are biting us, um, and just uh, we don't we don't usually pay attention to all the other critters that these things are carrying. We usually don't notice when our wings are deformed. This is <laughs> That's right. But it, you know, it could be that some of these novel sequences are the things that we should be surveilling for, but we don't know it yet. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I so, does true. Zika follow the same pattern as the other viruses that we discussed with regards to the expansion of the uh, varieties of this virus once it gets into a mosquito or an invertebrate host, and then there's this bottleneck as it gets back into the mammalian host, uh, all those differences are lost and it reverts back to a, a, just the several types rather than maybe 20 different varieties, let's say. Do you think Zika yeah, behaves that way? We, we didn't look at that explicitly, but we didn't really see a huge increase in the genetic diversity of viruses from the mosquito component pools compared to viruses from human samples. So if you start with a, um, a sterile mosquito, let's say, and you infect it with a single viral particle, I know that's hard to do, but let's say a single virus sure, strain. Sure, a single population. Yeah. Uh, what's the outcome of that infection in the mosquito? 
Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's really. Uh, I don't think we have a good answer for that yet with Zika. Um, I know one of the 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 lead author on the first paper, Nate Grubaugh, is, is really interested in that sort of stuff and has done some great work on other viruses mm-hmm. between between the invertebrate and the vertebrate hosts. So um, I'm sure that's something that he's going to jump on and 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 make some progress on at some point. Yeah, because that was a West Nile thing that we were looking at, as I recall, and that's another Flavivirus, virus, of course. So just wondered if there's a biological grouping that sort of all follows the same way. Yeah, I don't know. HIV does a sort of a similar thing where it's transmitted sexually and goes through this huge bottle. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. a lot of viruses do that. What about dengue? Which um, strain, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it probably does as well. One of the things that we did find out uh, about in this uh, in this paper on the genetic diversity and Zika virus evolution is um, – in the Americas, where is the diversity in the genome of, of Zika? And I was expecting that we would see a huge amount of diversity in the E protein, which is the envelope that's on the outside of the virus that has to do with, you know, binding to the cell and uh, evading the immune response, all that sort of stuff. And a lot of viruses have very, very uh, high variability in their E proteins. And we didn't really see very much variability in the E protein section of Zika from all over the Americas. Pretty straightforward that there's, there's not a lot going on there. Interesting. Hmm. A couple of weeks ago on Twitter, we did a paper. I think you were absent, Dixon. I was. I listened to it. I listened to it. They looked at, <laughs> at, at um, this is a West Nile study yeah, that's right. at from mosquito spit in individual mosquitoes, and they could look at the variation. And within mosquito, you get a huge amount of variation, but it's all gone. It's purified when it, it gets transmitted. So they're, as, as Scott just said, they're bottlenecks that reduce the amount of variation that you see. Mm-hmm. Now here it was interesting. They they looked at all the different all the mutations. I think there was a thousand thirty mutations in this whole data set. And they, they say, you know, which of these are functionally important? And then they make the statement, any effect of these mutations cannot be determined from these data. And I think that's great because it, there was there would be a time years ago when the sequence groups would never put that in. Right, because then their next grant wouldn't be <laughs> They would say, <laughs> here are the important mutations. That's like, right. You can't do that without doing experiments. That's right. So I'm glad they said it. And in fact, they can't tell uh, uh, which thing. But one, one curious aspect is the effect on diagnostics, right? Ah. Uh. Right, right. So several of the primer sets that are used for QRT-PCR, say, um, lay on top of regions that have some genetic diversity uh, in the Zika, in, in the American Zika populations. Yeah, that could be a problem. You can't amplify it if there's a change there. Right. It's, you could have strains that, that end up below the radar because yeah. of that. If you go right. back to the island of Yap, which we think where this thing came from. <laughs> I want to live on Yap just, yeah, yeah. just to have that address. All we do on TWIP is Yap. I mean, come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> TWIP, we're Yappers. Yeah, we so what's happened to the virus there? What do you mean? What's happened in what sense? Then the, the is diversity of strains. The sequence? Right, exactly right. Exactly right. Well, there's no... I think, uh, go ahead. Have they wiped think, it out? Sharon would volunteer to go back to the South Pacific and test. <laughs> I, yeah, I would love to just figure out what's going on if anybody would have like you to. Been, have you been to Yap? I have not, no. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, yeah, part of my uh, bucket list is to go. <laughs> yap, I want to go they, to Yap. They, um, they have traditional, uh, uh, traditional money that's made out of giant pieces of stone, I believe. Nice. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That's about my, the extent of my knowledge of YAP, and apparently there are great dive sites there. But. Apparently, yes. That's true. All right. Anything else on this one before we move on? Um, wow. It's, and these are open access, by the way. Both of them, yeah. yeah. Both of them are open access, and um, they were posted to BioArchive um, beforehand yeah. prior oh, nice. to publication. Yeah. All right. The other paper, uh, a recent paper – of uh, yours is a journal of virology paper with fewer authors. <laughs> fewer. Many fewer authors. <laughs> Variable inhibition of Zika virus replication by different Wolbachia strains in mosquito, mosquito cell cultures. Interesting, interesting. And this interestingly comes in part from, well, at Boston University, Florida Gulf Coast, of course, Sharon and Scott, but uh, the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratories, the needle. Oh, yes. The needle, yes. So there's a story there and how the collaboration started. Um, so Michaela Schultz, she was a former student and undergraduate at Florida Gulf Coast University, and she worked in our lab after she graduated for a little bit, then went off to grad school um, at um, um, 
Boston University and has been working with Horatio and John Connor. And um, when um, she was working on some projects on her PhD and she, when Zika came about last year, she wanted to go back sort of to her virus route. She had worked with us with uh, dengue in the lab. And um, she approached us about a joint collaboration, sort of wanted to get um, uh, some of the techniques behind growing Zika, reagents, and things like that. So she actually spent some time down here in Florida with us, um, just getting her, her, her project up and going, took it back to, to Boston, and just, I mean, spearheaded the whole thing and, 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 and wrote this very nice paper, pretty much. Um, it, was, it was Michaela with the support of, of John and Horatio. Neat. So this was to look at, and we know that Wolbachia can inhibit many viruses, including Zika. This was to look at a different, a couple of different Wolbachia strains. Right. So, so it's looking at um, Wolbachia strain from Aedes albopictus mosquitoes and another one from a plant hopper to see if um, they could inhibit Zika in the same way that Wolbachia pipiens, which is um, has been already looked at for um, uh, flavivirus control in mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. So she was exploring, let's try a different, uh, different strains of Wolbachia, um, sort of uh, with the assumption that there would be bottlenecks depending on which species and strain people were working on. She wanted to see if there were other alternatives that would um, likewise inhibit flaviviruses such as Zika. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that some of these Wolbachias have a fitness cost on their host. They make them mm-hmm. sick. So it's not something you want to put surprise, out there. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> well, not right. all not all of them do, right? So that's interesting. Right, yeah, they just take over and, yeah, the, the host doesn't do well. And, yeah, so that's not going to really well, work well for control. Right. I mean, the idea of making mosquitoes not do well sounds appealing, but of course, then you wouldn't get this thing. <laughs> no, you, they won't you would, spread them anymore. You wouldn't spread it in the population as effectively, so you want something that... That yeah. spreads silently. Now, should we get rid of all the mosquitoes on the planet? No. Dixon is shaking his head no. Well, even if you can't. I mean, you can't, but if you would that be a desirable you thing? You snap your fingers and they're gone? Yeah. What would happen? Oh, I think you'd upset a lot of different ecological webs. Not the fish web, though, right? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Depends yeah. on the fish. <laughs> Maybe. But bear in mind, there, there are hundreds of species of mosquitoes. More. Sure. Thousands. If not thousands. There are thousands. And we really don't much care about most of them. Correct. Right. But other animals do. All right. So we <laughs> care about Aedes do. aegypti, right? We care about Aedes aegypti. We, we care about uh, Anopheles gambiae. Gambi- we Gambi- care about, uh, you know, a couple of others. And Felix pipiens. <laughs> Felix pipiens, yes. It'd be nice to get rid of a few particular species of mosquitoes. And I don't know, would the, would, what yeah. would the impact of that be? Well, yeah. Aedes aegypti is invasive through much of its range. So if you wiped out a species that wasn't there in the first place, is that a good thing? Yeah. Where, where did it come from originally? What, Aedes aegypti? Yeah. I don't know. I know Sub-Saharan where Elbow Pictus. Sub-Saharan Africa. Elbow Pictus. And aegypti, I believe. Yeah. So maybe there, if you got rid of it, it would have an impact, an ecological yeah. impact. Yeah, it well, might. They, they introduced Aedes um, um no, an, enough of these Gambi mm-hmm. into South America accidentally via the slave trade. Yeah. And they actually got rid of it. So they, they, they had a dramatic reduction in malaria transmission mm-hmm. after they got rid of it. <clears throat> so there is a there is a, a reason for wanting to do it, but um, how do you do it? That's well, that's another issue, right? It's hard to do, but I'm just yeah. thought question. No, right? that's a good question. What I liked about this paper is that they actually tried to figure out the mechanism by which Wolbachia inhibits it doesn't completely eliminate replication but it substantially inhibits it and i haven't seen a lot of that before and and this it seems to be an early step in replication it could even involve entry or but, competition for resources Once i wonder what it. the authors have to say yes <laughs> yeah that's, you think we should ask <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it, it does appear to be an early um entry step um oh. So translation of um, what was it, NS5 is, is, is pretty much gone by looking at Western blot, um, looking at viral genome copies that's highly reduced. It looks like there's one of the Wolbachia strains, the, the stry, the one from the leafhopper, seems to be more effective at reducing um, viral um, viral copies than the other strain. And it seems to have similar effects in both an American strain that I was isolated in Puerto Rico and the um, MR-766, the um, 
the Asian strain um, mm. um, from Uganda. So yeah, it's, it seems to be an early step. Um, and, and also it was interesting to see the effect of um, lipids, uh, cholesterol, and how that might have um, an impact on on virus replication. And again, there's there's still a lot that could be learned about the mechanism, but it does give some indication that it's an early step. Mm. Meaning it gets in and then something happens. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So how many Wolbachia per cell are there? <clears throat> is that a variable number or is that a pretty a standard question. number? Do you know, Sharon? I know Michaela so, would know. So, yeah, the density changes, actually. So, see, I'm looking at um, figure two. Um, so, they're actually the density of Wolbachia in the 80s albopictus cells is actually different. So even though it's it's a co-infection, it's in there, but n- there's there's variability in how much of the bacteria is in the cells and the actual number per cell. I'm, I'm not really sure I, I have the answer to that. I think that impacts in inhibition, right? The more... Yeah. It, Maybe yeah, the, the, more the more Wolbachia, the, more the less the virus. But yeah. then, of course, it may also impact fitness, so... Right, off. right. So you add too much, it kills the host. If yeah. you don't add enough, it doesn't inhibit the virus. Yeah. Do you, Sharon, do you have Wolbachia in your lab? Are you working with it at all? Um, no, we're not working with it here. Michaela took um, her um, stocks back with right. her to Boston. Right. right. Okay. Now, before anything else before we move on, I, heard. I, I have something I wanted to add yeah, about yeah. the three papers in Nature. There was also a News and Views by Michael Warby. Right. And I yes. had... He, Two things I wanted to kind of read to you. So this uh, is directly from his uh, article. These papers, along with the report this year on Ebola, set a new standard for what can be achieved by studying disease outbreaks in tantalizingly close to real time using rapidly obtained genome sequences analyzed in a powerful computational framework. Such work is possible mostly through the sustained efforts of a fairly small number of scientists supported by modest grants from a few enlightened funders. These breakthroughs <laughs> not only are impressive in themselves, but also to expose large gaps in current approaches to detecting and responding to potentially catastrophic disease outbreaks. System- system- systematic pathogen surveillance is within our grasp, but is still undervalued and underfunded relative to the magnitude of the threat. And then he makes this uh, analogy of virus as wild for fire. Yes. <laughs> okay. And he says this is because he used to be a forest fire. A forest firefighter. In fire-prone areas of North America, lightning is expected, storms are tracked, and each strike is pinpointed. Planes fly out at night at, at, at first light to look for smoke near each strike point, and firefighters are on the same site uh, on the site the next morning. This mentality needs to be applied to emerging infectious diseases. The responses to the recent Ebola and Zika outbreaks undoubtedly involved great courage and ingenuity, but they have looked too much like valiant bucket brigades organized after the fire <laughs> is out of control. So true. So, yeah. Blame, I just, blame Pinchot for that. I, so I, I like the analogy mostly because I just, you know, was in a national park where forest fire is a major concern. There's a fire in Glacier National Park almost every summer. And uh, this whole thing about it being a s- small number of scientists with uh, a small amount of funding and uh, the importance of surveillance and doing this kind of work. Yeah, Only like, you can prevent spillovers. I, no, but, <laughs> right. but there's a big uh, there's a big difference here, though, that I will readily point out, and that is that forest fires are good, and virus well, outbreaks are bad. They <laughs> so can be. They have learned yes. that you can't defeat Mother Nature when it comes to putting out these huge fires. You have to let them burn, but you have to control the burn. Right. So I, I while I was out there when Vincent mm-hmm. was. Uh, flying home, I saw a wonderful special on one of the local channels about the Big Burn, which was in 1910. They had a huge, huge fire that killed 78 uh, forest rangers and all kinds of things. And the savior for one of these cities was the um, the um, the black um, cavalry members, the Buffalo um Come on, Alan, you know the name of this group. Um, Buffalo Buffalo. Soldiers. That's right, the Buffalo Soldiers. Soldiers, They were called in in desperation because nobody wanted them there, but they were the only ones left. So they called them in, and they they actually started a backfire, which swept towards the oncoming fire. The oncoming fire sucked all the oxygen, and it attracted the backfire to it, and then it burned off the intermediate zone. And and 
and there was nowhere for the fire to go afterwards. And so they saved this entire town. So, so useful fire. I don't think you can't go beyond a certain level of, of a comparison because I think looking for outbreaks of disease. Right. Analogies break down at a certain point, but I think there is, there, there is the good point that um, this type of constant ongoing monitoring that's that's diversified across no, that's many fine. small sites is an appropriate way oh, to sure. detect threats before they can spread. No question. Um, and it's appropriate to cast that as something that would have to be done on an ongoing basis because you'll never completely eradicate this threat. Right. That, that has to be done at a very high level. You can't have individual R01s doing that. You need to have a like a human genome kind of project, well, a moonshot. It cannot be... It, you know, because you have to do it all over the world, right? It you do. You need it. You need it coordinated at a high level. But I would agree with the with the um, the news and views uh, author's perspective that um, that this is something that needs to be set up locally all over the place. Yeah. So the problem, and the, do not take R one money away for it, please. No, don't. right. <laughs> so WHO has a wonderful in place influenza monitoring system, yeah. right? Because it's yeah. based on case description. Right, that's a people thing. Right. This is, this is a mosquito thing, so that that uh, is a little bit different. That's all. Yeah, the flu the flu works well. They have thousands and thousands of laboratories all over the world, collaborating centers, right? That exactly. right. collect specimens from people with flu and they right. sequence them and do antigenic studies. And you should have sick mosquitoes coming in and <laughs> <laughs> doing the same thing. I totally agree. But at least I was. But at least with the flu, you know that it's going to come back every year. The thing that happened with yeah. Zika is That's nobody right. really saw it coming. That's right. And so it's really hard to prepare for that as far as funding. If we look at the various groups sure. that were involved in, in this work, um, very few of us were funded specifically to work on yeah. Zika. And so yeah. by the time you write a proposal to answer the question, the outbreak is over it's and gone. done with. So <laughs> you really, right. there needs to be a mechanism to get things started without even knowing what the next threat is going to be. That's very hard because to get people to fund something you don't know about is, is, yes. is just <laughs> forget it. Right? You go to Congress, we need this because we don't know what's coming. Yeah. No, forget There's it. only one group that can do that and get funded, and that's DARPA. There we go. Well, maybe they should be doing <laughs> the only it. ones. They say, we just need some money. They say, don't tell us how much, just go do it and we'll pay it. <laughs> I, and that's I, how I, tell us what you're doing. Exactly I, right. I totally agree, but getting the money. I once, a couple of years ago, just like two years ago at an ASM meeting, there was a panel discussion, and Ian Lipkin was up there, and a guy from CDC. And I got up and said, "What? What about looking at all the viruses out there? Uh, uh, you know, surveillance completely." And he said, "I don't think that's very useful." The CDC guy said, "I don't think that's very useful." <laughs> Did Ian Lipkin agree with him? <laughs> no, I don't remember. It's, it's, on, it's on video. I have to pull it up. Right. But he just. <laughs> I said, what about learning about all that's out there and on a constant surveillance base? Nah, I don't think it's Don't you remember good. what the Surgeon General said about infectious yeah, diseases? Yeah, it's over. It's, over. <laughs> it's all over. That's right. It's tough. It is. Virus. It's all over. <laughs> I, I think that we should point out that the sequencing was n done from clinical specimens, right? Mm-hmm. And from mosquitoes. And not by... Yeah, they're clinical too. <laughs> we think of people, but there was no cell culture passage or anything like that. That's no, all, yeah, all straight from no. the samples. Yeah, and yeah. that's important mm -hmm. so you don't bias anything. In, in right. Any and and multiple different methods of sequencing were used to double check. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, one final question about that. So there's a reservoir for Zika after the uh, acute phase, uh, either saliv saliva or semen. Do, is the strain of virus found in those places different than the original virus that infected the person? Um, well, from what we saw, we isolated multiple, um, well, we got multiple genome sequences from urine as well as serum, and there didn't seem to be any difference. Okay. Um, and I, I know a couple of other groups have looked at um, serum and breast milk and saliva and urine and haven't seen any differences either. Right. Even, even over longer time periods. Uh, I don't know anyone who's done long, long time periods. Um, I mean, there might be some data that, that hasn't been published yet. I, I don't know. But everything, it doesn't mean that, that diversity doesn't exist. It, it just means that everyone looking with the sequencing techniques that they're using, uh, that I know about anyway, has uh, found the same virus in every compartment in any one particular patient. So you'd say these are favored sites rather than uh, privileged sites, rather than um, viral change that, uh, that escapes the immune system. 
That's my guess at this point. <clears throat> okay. All right. Now, before we move on, I want to discuss a few more things with Sharon and Scott. Kathy, maybe you would like to talk about this uh, Zika serum bank briefly? Sure. I had forgotten that I sent this to you. It was some, and I can't even remember where I saw it, but the Global Virus Network uh, has announced that they're an independent nonprofit organization founded in 2011 in Washington, D.C., 38 centers, six affiliates, and 24 nations. It, the vision is to prevent, contain, and control viral epidemic threats through collaboration of a global network of expert virus laboratories. And so to assist with diagnostics and vaccines and better understand humoral immune responses to Zika, the Global Virus Network, thanks to a generous gift from Allergan, has established a patient serum bank. And so if you want to request samples, you fill in a request form and the request will be reviewed to determine the best use of these limited Zika positive human serum plasma samples. And Vincent uh, we'll probably put the link in, but it's gvn.org slash Zika. Wow, that's easy. G no. Even Dixon, gvn.org slash Zika. I'll put a link I got to the it. documents <laughs> in the show notes. That's good. The other thing I wanted to touch on uh, relates to some work that Sharon and Scott published last year. We had talked about it in its bioarchive incarnation, mm -hmm. which you may remember, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> it was the and you were the first to put this on bioarchive the observation that antibodies to dengue enhance Zika virus replication in cell culture, correct? Yes. Troublemakers. <laughs> and the idea being that with dengue we know that prior infection uh, can make a second infection more severe, antibody dependent enhancement. And so the idea Say, does this happen for Zika? Do antibodies to dengue make Zika worse? So, so Scott and, and Sharon published a paper showing that, yes, the in cell culture, the antibodies will facilitate Zika virus infection, antibodies to Zika, to dengue. And other groups uh, also published similar observations, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now the question is, does this happen in an animal model? And recently, Quite a few uh, papers have been published looking at animal models, and I've, I've put three in here. We had, in fact, at the Hamilton meeting, another group uh, reported on this as well. So we have two papers in macaques, rhesus macaques, and one in an immunocompromised mouse line. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess you're familiar with these, right, Sharon and Scott? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, another paper we could maybe throw in here that uh, actually looked at uh, humans. Hmm. Is that the Barrick Lazier paper? Um, the, this the is one a Brazil group, yeah. Brazil group. Yeah, it's um, from, let's see, it's Mauricio Lacerna Nogueira. Mm -hmm. that's, is, that's one of the macaque papers, isn't it? Uh, no, that's the uh, Zika in infected patients, dengue prime Zika infected patients. Oh, that's a, that's a good one. That's in, I'd, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah. So what what is the, can you put the link in the show notes? Do you have them up in front of you so we could take a look at it? Let me pull that up. But meanwhile, we are, go ahead. we are talking about the same paper. I just got, uh, I was I was looking at the first author and Sharon's looking at the last. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, these these two systems differ in their findings. So in the macaque experiments, they basically infect them with dengue first, and then many, many, many months later, infect them with Zika. Mm -hmm. And they're two different groups. Um, let's make sure we give them. One is was a PLOS pathogens paper. The first author right. is McCracken, right? And mm -hmm. then the second one is... Um, <sighs> Too many papers open here. Um, Nature Communications. Nature Communications. Yeah, Pantoya is the first author. And so you infect with dengue, and I have a feeling that these are macaques used for dengue experiments because they're over a year previously. Mm -hmm. They're shown to have dengue antibodies, and they infect with Zika. And basically, there is no enhancement of Zika replication or any any uh, sign of Zika in, 
I don't know what happened. What did what did the macaques do in response to Zika virus uh, infection, uh, Sharon or Scott? Do you know? Uh, never having worked with macaques or any other um, non-human primate in Zika, um, I, I don't know. Yeah. But my my guess is Zika is probably originally a primate, uh, probably a, a sub-Saharan African primate virus. Yeah. Yeah. And and if you if you look at uh, dengue in uh, most non-human primate species doesn't do very much, and so I would expect that Zika in most non-human primates really doesn't do very much. Yeah, you get a viremia. Right, but there's there's no there's no real significant disease, kind of like what you see in most cases of human infection with Zika. Yeah, well, and so Zika was originally discovered in a which which primate were they using for that? But oddly enough, they were using an Asian macaque in, in a Africa. cage in right. sub-Saharan mm-hmm. Africa. Yes, <laughs> yeah, which would not be an native host for the No, virus. that's not the normal host, yeah. clearly. It would be an African host, yeah. Well, in these two papers, there's no effect of prior dengue immunity on the pathogenesis of Zika in these macaques. It's not enhanced in any way. But so in vitro there is and in vivo. Yeah, in fact, they take these dengue sera from these macaques can enhance in vitro. Huh. Right. They they did a, a great job on that. But let us let me go back to the one thing that uh, mm-hmm. um, – you just said, I, th- I think it was Dixon who said this, um, in, in vivo versus in vitro. So in, in vitro, certainly in tissue culture, in cell culture, any cell with an FC receptor, you know, it's, it's fairly mm-hmm. easy to get this enhancement effect. Um, and then a, a number of groups, including uh, one that you've put in, uh, that you were talking about today, um, if you um, if you look in mice, and, and usually these are immunodeficient mice, so this one paper, uh, uh, Susanna Bardina in Science, showed that STAT2 double knockout mice, um, you can recapitulate this antibody-dependent enhancement effect in these mice with Zika uh, and, and dengue antibodies. So mice, certainly in these uh, rodent models, immunodeficient rodent models, you get the ADE effect, but it doesn't look like you see it in these macaques. You mentioned FC. Is this complement dependent by any chance? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, well, it can be complement dependent. Most studies are done with heat inactivated yeah, serum, so you get that. yeah, you get rid of the complement. Um, I think there was a paper Mike Diamond published uh, a while ago. I hope I'm giving the credit to the right person, um, where uh, the, the the IgG subtype binding to complement influenced the amount of enhancement that you see. Hmm. So yes, I think the answer to your question is yes. So, so these results emphasize our, our saying, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, monkeys minimize. And mice lie. Yeah. Well, and cells I are totally it, vulnerable. <laughs> I think it might be a little more complicated than that because these are difficult experiments so. to do. And I, I think yeah. Sharon might have some sure. insights into yeah. this. But yeah, that- what's – right – so there, so I, I guess it's I th- the limit. It's a great study, and I think this is a direction that we need to be heading towards because we see this in vitro enhancement effects. And the question has been, what happens in vivo? So now we're looking at two different models. We're looking at a mouse that really has no good immune system. So virus, Zika virus, replicates super, super well, which is not a natural condition. And then we have non-human primates that have an intact immune system, and we're not really seeing an in vivo effect. We're looking at viremia comparing uh, dengue pre-immunity versus naive um, um, macaques. But one thing I wanted to point out is if, if we're thinking in terms of if, if there is an ADE effect similar to what is seen in dengue, if we look at dengue, for example, and I, I pulled out some numbers from the World Health Organization website, in the Americas alone, in 2015, there were 2.35 million cases of dengue reported, and that's just in the Americas, and that's reported, not non-apparent cases, just reported cases, of which 10,200 cases were diagnosed with severe dengue. So, you know, severe dengue, you know, maybe we're going you know, to throw ADE in there, among other things. And so, if we look at 10,200 out of 2.35 million, that's 
about 0.43% of cases where we're actually seeing severe disease. Mm. And so if we're looking at a study, so the primate studies are very, very expensive. We were looking at a primate study, and I believe the one from the University of Puerto Rico um, had a small number of animals. I think it had four that were dengue pre-immune and six or seven that were um, naive. And so a very small group of animals. And the PLOS pathogens paper had a, a few more, but not that many more. Um, it had six, six dengue pre-immune and then the 14 naive controls. And so if we're expecting to see what happens in a robust you know, population in vivo, um, if, if, if it follows what dengue does, if Zika enhancement does something similar to dengue, those numbers are going to be very, very small if we're going to see anything. And so right. I think the limitation of these studies will be cost and the number of animals that it can be done in. And so that sort of leads to where do we need to be looking at, which is the, the paper that Scott was um, talking about. Yeah, and Vincent, I emailed you the paper link. I, I couldn't put it in the docs, but I emailed it to you. And so um, we, if you want, we can talk about that. And I think that might be the direction that some of these studies need to be Heading. Let's let, take a look to see what's happening in the human population. And so there's limitations to all the different systems in vitro and the animal model in vivo systems as well. I think that's the difference be, between Zika and dengue. With dengue, we knew for many years about ADE, and then we made animal models to study it. But here, we're not quite sure if there is ADE uh, in Zika-infected people, and we're trying to make animal models first and and we can't interpret them. So I think you're right. We have to look in patients. Let me put this paper in the uh, show notes as we're talking here. By the way, this one this one paper, uh, which one is it? Uh, the Nature Communications. They say uh, they don't really like the immunodeficient mice. They say, we urge, <laughs> yeah. we urge caution in using immune-deficient mouse models to understand the pathogenesis of Zika in people. Agreed. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> They also say that the in vitro ADE assays are promiscuous and demonstrate no correlation with disease risk. So, what what do you any thoughts on that? Uh, I think uh, you know anytime you do something in in cell culture, yeah. uh, you have to take it with a grain of salt, absolutely, before you apply that to uh, human populations. Right. Um, well, these yeah, yeah, these systems are for different purposes, though, right? Right. I mean, so if I, you cell culture, you can get so much more mechanistic insight than you can from a macaque. Mm-hmm. Right. I think the macaque numbers are really uh, the, the issue, as as Sharon pointed out. And in fact, at, at the um, Hamilton meeting, there was a group from Wisconsin, David O'Connor, who was looking at Zika and macaques. And he many times made excuses for N equals one. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if you can't get good Numbers don't do the experiment, right? I just don't understand that. Right, yeah. So there's a maybe well, these are difficult experiments and they're expensive experiments, but but right, I mean if you if you can't get good statistics out of them, then really there's not you, you can't interpret very much. And Sharon was pointing out a, a minute ago about the the number of severe dengue cases being about a half a percent, 0.43, I think, in the Americas. Um, we don't know what those numbers might be for Zika, but there's a paper uh, in The Lancet from 2016 that talked about the incidence of Guillain-Barre mm. in Zika cases in adults and children in an outbreak in the South Pacific. And... Um, what they were able to show there is that about one in 4,000 infections resulted in Guillain-Barre, which is 0.025%. So again, um, with, with Zika and with, and with dengue, the incidence of severe outcomes is, is actually rare, right? quite rare. But it's probably still worth doing the experiments in monkeys, even if you only have a few monkeys to try it with, because if you do end up with a positive result, that could be very informative. Correct. Absolutely. Right. Yep. They need I mean, to get it done. It, it is a long shot, but we don't know how it's going to happen in the monkeys. And so it was worth it was worth doing these experiments. I think so. Worth doing the experiments, worth publishing it. Um but I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't uh, make a great deal about uh, the statistical um, significance. Right, because it's effectively a negative result. Yeah. All right. I can't find this paper. Maybe Alan can find it. It's uh, it's in clinical infectious diseases. Okay. And what is it? Ran- 
Yeah. Brand new. It doesn't even have page numbers. So it does. It's not showing up in, uh, in PubMed. It's called viral load and cytokine response profile does not support antibody dependent enhancement in dengue prime Zika virus infected patients. So this is a clinical study, which is what we need, as Sharon said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's I've got see. Oxford academic. We investigated where the patients previously exposed to dengue had higher viremia when exposed to Zika compared to patients not previously exposed. So that's exactly the study that you need to do. It's not an easy study. They measured viral loads and cytokine profiles during patients to the dengue. Neither dengue, neither dengue nor Zika viremia was higher in patients with prior dengue virus infection, although the power to detect such a difference was only adequate in the Zika analysis. So they don't see any signs of ADE. Um, but again, maybe it's the numbers or the numbers. Yeah, they selected the 65 clinical samples were collected um, from mm. patients that exhibited acute febrile disease, and so they had 65, and from that they broke it down into their different categories. So again, if we're looking at a rare event, yeah, we yeah. may not see it. Well, so we, I think Vincent, I just emailed you the link or the page. Yes, yeah, so I've got email. Yeah, that's I've got the sharing. abstract on on the IDSA site. Uh, or, yeah, or the Oxford the Academic paper site. The link I sent Vincent. Ah, wonderful. Okay. Well, I think that's the bottom line. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. But basically, yeah. Sharon, you need a bigger and more powered study is what you're saying, yes. right? Right, right. And interestingly more, enough, there – oh, go ahead, Sharon. And I was just going to say this. This is where we need to be heading. We just need – a bigger N. I mean, we're talking hundreds, maybe thousands, an N of yeah. thousands to be able to see any significance. So if we get enough monkeys and enough viruses in a room together. <laughs> I'll write Shakespeare. They would yes. type out all the, the genomes for every <laughs> living organism. <laughs> that's a lot oh, of monkeys. That's cool. That's yes. cool. <clears throat> all right. That's good. I, I'm, uh, I had not known about that one, but I was going to say that is what needs to be done, but in more mm -hmm. patients. Yeah. And especially, I think this is something that Sharon and I were talking about a little bit before. Um, there's no pregnant women included in, explicitly in this study. And this is yeah. the major effect of, of Zika. So, you know, we're, we not only need hundreds, maybe thousands of samples, but a lot of those samples, you know, need to be from pregnant women to, to see whether or not the microcephaly is, is being induced by this sort of an effect. And I'm not sure those are going to be easy studies to do. No, not at all. It's it's not easy to do. I mean, eventually what you would like to do also is to get, if you can show evidence for ADE, is to get B cells from these patients and see how the Zika antibodies differ. Sure, in yeah. Them versus, uh, or the dengue antibodies versus uh, people without ADE, but first have to show it, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think this that's the bottom line. You have to show this in people. And then perhaps you can start interpreting the animal experiments. And then if you show them in people, then you can go back and replicate yeah. that in macaques. Well, then you can right. have an animal model and you can start to dissect mechanisms. And I think that's what's, right. what's being done with dengue, right? Yeah. And then, then you can look for ways to inhibit the process and, and right. keep people safe. Yeah. Right. Every time I hear data like that, I always think that there are you know, these minor subsets of people with immune differences that reflect these results or a different history of infections yeah that we don't know about yeah, that's right so yeah, you're, there's, you're looking for sequential dengue outbreaks and followed by a, a zika outbreak and then see what happens but not, maybe not you get microcephaly that, maybe yeah so it's not just the sequential dengue outbreaks in zika but also the the immune state of the individual getting infected. So sure. if, if a woman is pregnant, you know, her immunity is going to be different. Her, her, her fetus's immunity is going to be different yeah. than a, a healthy individual that is not pregnant. So I think there's a lot of differences there, um, individual to individual. Yes. Sharon, of all the, what, 250 some odd cases in Florida, is that the right number? Local For last year or for this year? Total. Total. Locally transmitted cases. So... I got to pull that number. <laughs> Good. You don't remember. I think it's numbers. about two, 250, 256, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Exactly I think, what you said. Yeah. Yeah. 256 so confirmed. Of those, there were no cases of microcephaly. Is that correct? You know, I don't know for sure. We do have a lot. Well, we don't have a lot. We have uh, 
a number of cases of microcephaly in Florida, but I'm not sure that we have the data broke down by travel versus, travel versus local. versus local, yeah. Got it. Okay. All right, one last uh, paper I wanted to chat about, and then we're going to take this recording and chop it into pieces and mix them up so people right. can hear, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually sent in by a listener. <clears throat> it's a Nature Communications also. Oral pharyngeal mucosal transmission of Zika virus in rhesus macaques. This is from O'Connor's group at uh, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. The first author, Christina Newman, and the last authors, David O'Connor, Tom Friedrich. They've been on TWIV a couple of times, been out there with them. And they, they, they're another group using a macaque model to study uh, Zika virus. Now, when I first read the title, I thought, wow, they've shown <laughs> oral pharyngeal mucosal transmission of Zika virus in macaques, but... But in fact, what what they've done is two separate experiments. One where they pipette high titer of Zika virus onto the tonsils of uh, a couple of macaques. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> They'll eat your Eppendorf. <laughs> and then they measure by PCR Zika RNA in the blood, and they can see in a couple of days that uh, you can detect. Um, they call it viremia, but I would argue that it's. Let's make a new name for genomemia. Genomemia. PCRemia. That's right. All right, and that, that that is the basis of the title. That if you pipette Zika virus onto the tonsils, you can get oropharyngeal mucosal transmission. But to me, transmission means from animal to animal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And they do an experiment where they infect macaques by injecting virus, and then they take their saliva and put it into the mouth of another macaque, and that doesn't transmit. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. But the problem is, when they do the calculations, if I'm right about this, because they, they have a lot of RNA in their preps, in these saliva preps, but not a lot of infectious virus. Mm -hmm. it, it turns out they put a very little amount of virus onto these macaques in the saliva-saliva transmission. Here, saliva from one animal collected 10 days post-infection contained about 10,000 copies of RNA per mil. And remember, we don't know if it's the whole genome because it's just mm -hmm. more. Because the ratio of Zika RNA content to PFU is approximately 1,000 to 1, we estimate that the 50 microliter inoculum contained less than 1 PFU, 1 times 10 to the minus 0.25 PFU. Less than 1 PFU. Yeah. So I don't know. And maybe that's why it didn't... <laughs> You the saliva so didn't no, transmit. Were no viruses. I don't know any virus where <laughs> less than one PFU would transmit if you put it in the oral pharyngeal. Maybe now, Scott and Sharon, am I looking at this correctly? Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to see because I think they kind of did it purposely. They um they did the initial one where they put the virus in the tonsils to see if the animals got systemic viremia, but then they didn't want to do it that route to then transmit to the other naive. Um, animals because then you can get the inoculum, you know, yeah, the initial, yeah. you know, so, so yeah. that's why they did the sub Q and they injected. So I was trying to pull out how many particles they injected sub Q. And then they thought that that would maybe perhaps mimic more of the, you know, a uh, casual contact from one person to another. If you have viremia in your blood and then you have something in your saliva, how much of that is trans? Visible or transmittable to to someone that is close by, and they put it in their eyes, their tonsils, and their noses. And they, I think, their point is that they they found very little um, virus in the saliva after the sub Q. Uh, so even though the yeah, the animals yeah. were viremic, they they were unable to spread it by casual contact. And I think that was kind of their point to show that it's it might be a mode of transmission, but it's not going to be something that is very effective. Right. So, all right. There's not a lot of virus in saliva, basically. So, yeah, it's not going to likely transmit. Okay. And they also found, didn't they, that um, the saliva itself may have something that's reducing the infectivity? Right. It was inhibitory. So it seemed. So they just took saliva, mixed it with uh, Zika virus, and showed that it was able to inhibit virus replication. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's something in saliva that is not conducive to to spread. So. The, the real question is, how much does this reflect what happens in people? Mm -hmm. And we don't know because we know there's virus in human saliva, Zika virus, right? Um, whether it's as low titer as this, we don't know. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they say that this suggests that 
Zika is not transmitted by this route. But I would argue that you don't know what's going on in people based on this macaque study. Mm-hmm. Right. Because maybe they, I, maybe they have an inhibitor in saliva that we don't. Maybe the titer in saliva is just lower than in people. I mean, there are lots of differences. So There could be. But, you know, we don't see um, epidemiological evidence that people who are living in close contact but not having sexual relations, um, that they spread Zika. Right, right. Right. So I, I think this kind of confirms just the boots on the ground epidemiology. I don't know. I would say that it's probably pretty rare. I mean, the main mode is mosquito, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even sexual transmission is pretty low, right? So right. if it's going to be anything from saliva, it would be very low as well, and maybe you, you wouldn't pick it up. I mean, I don't know how you can this the so-called sexual transmission. I don't know how you can distinguish that from mucosal transmission, right? Because both could be participating, and so yeah. I think it's it's very hard, right? So from this, yeah, in, in macaques, it's low in the saliva, but um, maybe you need more epi in people to really look at this. And I was kind of, the title bothered me because it's there isn't right. <laughs> transmission, but the title says there is. So right. <laughs> I don't think that's right. <laughs> I think they should either say there is, no observed transmission or, or something else, but not to say there's transmission in the title. Yeah, it's, it's studies on oropharyngeal mucosal like transmission. <laughs> you, what, what you want them to start with is lack of oropharyngeal right. mucosal transmission. Right, because pipetting into the tonsil is not oropharyngeal transmission, right? No. Right. That's not what you right. do. If I asked Albert Sabin, you know, how <laughs> he would say from animal to animal. That's right? just an infection route. That's all. That's an say. infection route. It's not transmission. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Got it. All right. I've struggled with this a lot, <laughs> trying to figure out how they got to this title. And then uh, I think uh, there you go. Dixon. I think they just forgot the question mark <laughs> at the end of the title. <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe. That's right. Yeah, we'll blame it on the copy editors. Right. <laughs> it's just a typo. I got, an, I got a press. Speaking of typo, I got a press release from Penn State yesterday. Uh, describing the work of a virologist there that I know, and it started out by saying, this new study shows about, gives information about why antibiotics can't, why there may be resistance to antibiotics in in certain viral infections. Mm. And I thought, either they didn't send it to the PI or he didn't read it. Right. Right? Right. Right. He wouldn't leave antibiotics in there. Wow. I, it's unfortunate. Um, I would I would like to just read one email uh, because this is directed at uh, Dixon. And since you're here, we never know when you're going to be here. Here's This is from Hannah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Dear Twiv host, this email has nothing to do with virology, but I wanted to respond to Dixon's pick from Twiv447. I share his fascination with tiny creatures. Yeah, so this one. And his pick immediately brought to mind this Discover Magazine article about the third smallest insect, a beautiful parasitoid wasp. It's smaller than Paramecium caudatum or Amoeba proteus, yet amazingly, it still has compound eyes and wings and provides a link to a Discover Magazine. A complete organ system. Yes. (laughs) Several months ago, I had a chance to play with a scanning electron microscope myself. I wasn't able to produce anything like the images in Dixon's pick, but here are a few of mine, starting with a simple full-body shot of an eastern subterranean termite. Particular mm. <laughs> termites, flamipes. Oh, my gosh. How can you do that? Did you study these things? <laughs> I did, actually. I was, um, yeah. Oh. I made little um, sure. primary cell lines of them. Neat. Just oh. flowed off the tongue. And infected them with viruses. And it also sounds like you speak Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> I speak Spanish, not Portuguese. Oh, but you read that other title very well, I thought, from Brazil. <laughs> I, I was using the SEM to image something on the cuticles of termites. So almost all the shots I have, aside from this one, are unfortunately extreme close up. So this is a beautiful shot. It is. And then she really nice. says, because I can't resist, here are a couple of images of sad looking flagellates <laughs> that just happen to end up stuck to the cuticle. The termite hindgut is chock full of incredibly interesting symbiotic flagellates. Right. It turns out termites poop before dying when you fix them in ethanol. <laughs> I, <laughs> I probably would, I would too. too. <laughs> I image some of the flagellates purely because they look cool, and she sends two pictures for you, Dixon. Yes. No, I'm looking at them. Finally, here's something of a, a bit more artistic from when I was learning to use the SEM. 
a Drosophila melanogaster wing joint, followed by an extreme close-up of the eye. The, those bumps are called corneal nipples. Butterflies, moths have them too, and they're believed to have anti-reflective properties. Hmm. It's very cool. I lo- uh, beautiful. Do you know what each one of the cells from the compound eye is called? No. What, what is it's it? an omatidia. Omatidia. Uh, so isn't that, isn't that appropriate, though, because... There's a nipple on the omatidia. <laughs> <laughs> You're so inappropriate. Um, no, it's just a colloquialism. That's all. Come on. <laughs> My next email to you will be virus related. I promise. I love Twiv and your other <clears throat> podcasts, and I always look forward to the next episode. Cheers, Hannah. P.S. The weather in Berlin, Germany, is 18 Celsius <laughs> and partly cloudy. We've had a wet, miserable yeah. summer. That's really too bad. All right, and, and let me ask um, Kathy to read the last one because this this is important. Kathy, can you read this Aaron's? Aaron writes, and Aaron was a guest on Twiv. She will be. Oh, she will be a guest on 455. Okay. Dear Twivers, I'm a big fan of the Twix podcast family and have been listening for most of my scientific career. I love Twiv in particular and can't thank you all enough for the chance to hear from or about some of my science heroes. David Quammen, Paul Bianash, Sarah Sawyer, and Vincent Munster, just to name a few. It's great that I can listen to my favorite topic and learn new things while biking to work every day. <laughs> I'm a fourth-year graduate student in Michael Emmerman's lab at the University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. I actually decided to rotate in his lab thanks to the TWIV episode he did back in 2013. When listening to the most recent episode, 447, I was excited to hear you discuss the possibility of bringing on a new female virologist to occasionally help with the show. I recently began thinking more seriously about a career in science communication, perhaps in journalism or policy, and I've been looking for opportunities to get involved. I can't help but think that a graduate student would be a fun addition to the crew, (laughs) mainly because it adds another level of diversity to the team. A graduate student would add the different perspective of someone who hasn't been in the field for quite as long and might not think the same way a professor would. In my young career, I've had experience studying the evolution of dengue and HIV, SIV, but I'm enthusiastic and about, about nearly any topic I can get my hands on. I'm not sure whether my voice is radio worthy or not, <laughs> but I would love to offer my services if you decided to bring in more people. Regardless of whether you add a new voice or not, I look forward to future episodes and enjoy listening as it evolves. Best Aaron. P.S. The weather in Seattle is somewhat depressing <laughs> for late June. It's partly cloudy and 65 Fahrenheit, 18 C. Sounds like Berlin. <laughs> I believe your audition is scheduled right. for next week. Aaron. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. The audition is scheduled for next week. We have a few people Great. who are going to be coming through and right. giving us more, uh, a more different sound, I guess you could Indeed. put it. Indeed. All right. Let's do some picks. I don't know, Sharon and uh, Scott, do you remember picks of the week from last time? Yes. Um, yes. I, I actually pulled one. It's uh, Have you guys heard of The Conversation? It's uh, Academic Rigor Journalistic Flair. No. Um, and so there's di- different topics, art and culture, economy, business, education, science and technology. And so as, as an academic, you can um, work with an editor and write a piece about something that you are working on or are interested in and, and, and sort of address it to a mass audience. So it's sort of, you know, sending out your information to, to, to the world. And so the, the one that I chose was one written by Michaela Schultz, who was the first author in the uh, Journal of Virology paper that we talked about today. And she wrote one, infecting mosquitoes with bacteria so they can't infect us with viruses like Zika <laughs> and dengue. Cool. And I thought she did a really nice job writing it. It really summarizes it. It explains it well. And I, I thought that might be a good thing to add. Um, and it's a really good opportunity for any scientist who just really wants to, you know, get a crack at writing to a mass audience and, and getting other people excited about their work. Look, it's even got a picture of her here. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah, it's neat. I I didn't know about this. I, there's similar things in other fields. Uh, Tim Recorth talked about neurite, remember, which is kind of a s- similar thing um, for neurological scientists, but this is pretty cool. This yeah. is broader. Yeah, I did one a while back in January um, about uh, dengue virus antibodies may worsen a Zika infection, so a similar thing to what Michaela did. is just kind of really fun to write, and you have somebody who, I mean, you think you can write, but when you go back <laughs> yeah. to the editor, they really... Um, <laughs> 
you know, it's it's a humbling experience. But Indeed, it was, it I, is. I had a lot. Welcome of to my head. world. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Did they change your writing, Alan? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's what editors do. the yeah. the object the the object of the game from the writer's perspective is to write well enough that they don't have to edit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's an ideal that's never actually achieved in practice. <laughs> right. As far as I know. Cool. That's great. Thank you. Scott, do you have a pick for us? I have a bunch of picks. So last time <laughs> um, I, I, I mentioned um, Next Strain by Trevor Bedford. And I've just been overwhelmed by the number of people who are putting online bioinformatics software up and making that available to everybody and how useful that stuff is. So shout out to all the all the bioinformatics software people out there. Um, and and I got a couple that that I wanted to point out in particular that I've been using a lot. If you want to hear them all, or I can just leave it like that and and be you know you, could, you all are great. You could tell us, sure. Go ahead. I've been using this program called Signal P, finding secreted proteins. Um, you can find that online under Signal P if you Google it by um, Heinrich Nielsen, I think. Um, there's another one called Pecan, which is really useful for annotating phage some of the most diverse weird viruses written and, and put up by Claire Reinhardt from uh, Western Kentucky. Um, Famorator is by this guy, Steve Krishan at James Madison. He's just got the thing up and running on, uh, on the web browsers now and uh, an old, but a great piece of software DNA master by Jeffrey Lawrence from the university of Pittsburgh. So just great stuff out there. Use, mm. use bioinformatics software um, that's available. Now there's a ton of it. You can do all sorts of stuff. So uh, Eugene Koonin would tell mm-hmm. you it's not bioinformatics, it's computational biology. <laughs> okay, yes. Because <laughs> he I, corrected Rich and I, we called him a bioinformatician. He said, no, 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 in his Russian accent. So said, computational <laughs> biology. <laughs> it's okay uh, with me, but I'm just, it's funny. <laughs> Something about that. Yeah, isn't it great how people are putting these out there for, for everyone to use? I think it's great. I think it is. Right. Super like useful toolbox. stuff. And a toolbox, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Alan, what do you have? Um, I have a video and a YouTube channel. Um, so the video is, uh, if you thought your experimental organism was difficult to work with, check out what this guy does. So it's about a two-minute or minute-and-a-half documentary. It's called The Eagle, the Eagle Whisperer. And this <laughs> fellow goes and he um, uh, mm. visits eagle nests nice. and <clears throat> is tracking them for the, I guess, the California uh, wildlife folks. And uh, um, so he climbs up to where the eagles have nested, which of course tends to be inaccessible, dangerous places for humans and goes in and um, uh, deals with these large, you know, razor clawed, raptors that are not mm-hmm. happy to see him and to get his samples and track their health. Um, this is part of a, a channel, uh, a YouTube uh. channel called the great, <laughs> called great big story, um, which does just this. They do minute and a half, two minute documentaries about all kinds of stuff. And they're really, really well filmed and shot and, and reported. And it's just, you could spend hours on this thing. This is so cute. He's got a lot of baby and he goes yes. up and they're yelling at him. Yes. And one of them, he rubs the chest. <laughs> yeah. He didn't bring him a fish. <laughs> I'm waiting for the mom to come back, which would be substantially bigger. And yes. Take and his eye out. Bad news. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure how he times that, but. It's so cute. Oh, one of them just pooped on him. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the commentary. It's pretty cool. He, he, he repels up, I guess, right? Yeah. Really neat. Or down. They have great views. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This is gorgeous. We seem to have a lot of poop in TWIV. <laughs> oh, yeah. This time. The That's termites another. and the eagles. <laughs> viruses, yeah. The viruses. bear. We even have a the title, bear. Poops, Viruses, and Worms, without any commas. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I was looking at that the other day. That was a cool one. That's nice. Thank you. Um, Dixon? Yes. I bet you have a magazine article. How did you guess? Well, it's actually listed right here, so that you didn't have to guess, actually. Uh, I've recently subscribed to Cosmos Magazine. It's um, a self-admitted um, 
defect, perhaps in my uh, scientific literature choices. But I enjoy this magazine because it, it takes real science and it makes it understandable for people that don't have science backgrounds. But they also like a better, lot of even visions. better than Twiv. No, nothing's better than Twiv. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so you're welcome. So this this looks good and it's horrible. Mm. There's there's something that attracts us, uh, sort of like in a morbid f- fashion, to something that looks so different than we have been used to looking at, like a forest or a lake or a stream or you know a, a verdant field of wheat even this thing takes industrial scars and abstracts them by taking a close-up views of various points on there and it reminded me of my trip recently to yellowstone national park where i uh, i was driving along the firehole river and there's a lot of uh, geothermal events that occur along this river and that, hence the name firehole and one of them has the most remarkable delineated microbial set of populations that goes from like dark black to green mm. to purple to yellow to orange. And you see this huge streak coming out of no place and going down and of course into the river. And, and you're looking at, you know, um, extremophiles basically. So mm. that's not what this is. What this is, is we are the extremophile on the landscape. And, and, and this shows you the scars that we've left. And it's quite sobering to see the amount of damage that human beings have caused. And this is just a little part of it. So mm. I, I use that as not a positive take, but uh, don't keep doing this if you want to survive, basically. This Louisiana one, the plume of aluminum ore waste. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's frightening. It's beautiful. As you say, it's beautiful. It but, is, but it's not. When you know what you're looking at, it's yeah. not beautiful. Yeah, now, they're, they're straight down aerial views, so they're very abstract looking. Exactly. But then you read the caption, you say, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, that's you know, like these, uh, the, the, the large barrel... Um, a uh, thermal pool in Yellowstone. It's a quite a beautiful thing to look at. And you're looking down into the center of the earth, basically, you know, right. um, it's, it's not that, but it, it but it, it mimics that in some ways and mm. just a very depressing way and of so looking the, at it. This uh, site relates to a book then, because at the bottom there's a book trailer, um, industrial scars, the hidden costs of consumption. Yeah, you know, I think that's right. Yes. I think that is right. That's right. That's right. So there's a there's a preachy message that goes along with the pictures, I'm sure. But preaching the good gospel in this case. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? Well, in the uh, <laughs> arc of things about the eclipse, I found this site that has – uh, eclipse by information by zip code. So you put in your zip code and it shows you exactly what you'll see where you are at and at what time of day. And then if you go down lower on the page, you can find um, uh, a kind of a concurrent view of what's happening as the eclipse goes across the country and the, and the little crescents of, of sun that you'll see. And so I just find it uh, really fun to watch. And for those who aren't going specifically to a totality zone, you can see when the uh, eclipse will be happening in your neighborhood and what you'll, what you should expect to see when you're looking cool. at through your, yeah. your special glasses or your pinhole viewer. That's right. Assuming there's no clouds. Right. Yes. And that's the big assumption. My wife and I are trying to decide where to go. And, uh, you know, the closest place from where we live on a direct straight line is Knoxville, Tennessee. And that's ninety five percent total. Go drive. Yeah, go we're gonna it. drive. We will. But but how do you know that when you get there one day before, that the next day you'll have sunshine? Yeah. You don't. You don't. You don't yeah. have a clue. So you know you're hung up. Uh, my wife has relatives that live in Charlotte, uh, Charleston, uh, South Carolina, rather, and that's in the, the, the total the zone. Mm-hmm. Should we fly down there and just you know what do we do? And how do you just, how do you pick a place? Uh, Just do a twiv. Stay home. <laughs> hotels and motels along the oh, line forget of it. totality forget have it. You, jacked up yeah. their prices like crazy. Yeah, <laughs> if if you have not, if you have not booked a room in the zone of totality, you are not staying there. Correct. And <laughs> if you're going to drive anywhere close, like uh, we were hearing about a place on the on the interstate, yeah. you know, where a bunch of trailers are probably just going to happen to break down um, <laughs> that you'll exactly. want to make sure you have plenty of gas. That's right. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's it all the, all the, um, 
municipalities and states along this path are currently treating this as a major disaster. That's right. They um, because they're they're expecting a tremendous amount of of clogging and disruption, um, yeah. Yeah. which I, I my family and I are going to be contributing to. We are going to try and go see it. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going, Alan? South Carolina. Right. Uh, we. Yeah, I've got I've got a plan for seeing it, and you got to fly. Uh, yeah, and so we <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to see this thing, and and we'll see, and I'll report back later. Exactly. But the the weather in South Carolina has been in a really cloudy, rainy, <laughs> yes. yucky pattern, and it. I really hope that that clears up. Yep. soon <laughs> i hear what you're saying if you look out our window right now it's just exactly like that you wouldn't see a yep. thing except it just gets dark that is a really cool website just, it is yeah i keep <laughs> clicking over it it's really cool we have a yeah. colleague sal silverstein whose um summer home is in jackson wyoming he's in the epicenter of the percent uh, oh. totality is he going to be there i think he is <laughs> yes. i think he will be <laughs> well i'm missing it i'm going to be at a retreat so we're going to be inside at 3 p.m. on Monday <laughs> up in uh, Boston College. Ah, Boston. Actually, the retreat's in Dover. Is that it? Devers? Outside of Boston. Danvers? Danvers. Thank you. Danvers. Well, you could Everybody's still- Everybody's going to need you, a bio break. Right. Yeah, if you, can, if you can step out and, you know, get your, get your eclipse glasses or your pinhole um, mm. set up, a partial solar eclipse is kind of cool. I totally agree. Um, I partially agree. Yeah. <laughs> I think totality, I, I've never seen a total one, though, so I'm really I'm nor hoping have I. Nor I think the, have this I. zone of totality. That's a pretty cool phrase. Fair. I've never heard yes. of that before. <laughs> that's right. All right. I have a, a, a different pick. It's not sciencey at all, but it's really cool. It's cool. It's a short video um, called Bottle. It's and lovely. It's an animation. Mm -hmm. You should just watch it. It's from yes. the it's from the it, a channel called Film School Shorts, mm -hmm. and they have other shorts that are very nice as well. If you want to explore them, these are by people who are in film school and making cool things. And this just the animation is just great. Uh, it involves sand and snow <laughs> and water and a bomb. Yes. So just check it. I think it's really, really cool. good. It's really it well done. Really good. It's just like you know. Students can do such cool things, right? Short mm -hmm. and really. So there you go. We also have a listener pick from Kevin. Dear Professors Twiv, you mentioned on a previous podcast, 449, that the lecture format is not dead and stellar teaching brings new aspiring researchers into the field. Having been one of Professor Racaniello's students, I agree, but I feel that many science undergrads also have numerous horror stories about awful <laughs> lecturers who cared little for teaching and only desired to return to the lab in a particularly illustrative case, a friend once described a class as the ballet because the professor doesn't really care if the students are learning. He doesn't even care if they're present. His job is to show up at the blackboard at 840 and dance. <laughs> <laughs> How do we reconcile the need for good undergraduate science education with the fact that hiring tenure and job security are tied to research, not teaching? Mm. It's tough. I have a listener pick on an equally uplifting topic. <laughs> I was hoping the host could discuss how prevalent the article's situation is and what advice you have for young scientists who are discovered uh, by the research funding Discouraged. system. And this is a science article called Another Tenure Track Scientist Bites the Dust. Mm. Assistant professor in a large research university. Uh, you know, it doesn't get tenure. Six-year assistant professor. Um, and this is a story of it. Best Kevin. Kevin was a student in my class. P.S. <laughs> yeah. P.S. I miss Professor Racaniello's class and be nice to Dixon. That's right. He actually hold, held the sign up once in class <laughs> saying, be nice to Dixon. Yeah. <laughs> so he was a listener. That's right. How, so how did he do in class? Right. I don't remember. I'm sure he did well. He was very enthusiastic and always asked questions. And um, he likes Dixon, I guess. He listened to Twiv, so he must have done well. <laughs> Hey, the feeling's mutual. <laughs> so he, he asks us, how common is this? It's very common. People don't get tenured. I have seen it all the time. Oh, we have, all of us have here, seen it. Many, many times here. On, you and I, Dixon. Um, Kathy, have you seen it many times? Not so many times. But really? Yeah. Oh. How about- You think state universities are different than private schools? Maybe. Well, or you Michigan, have a much larger- Michigan is a, Michigan is a special place. 
<laughs> no, no, no. They have a very large faculty. I mean, yeah. it's larger than ours. Um, now, at, at Florida Gulf Coast, the, it's a different kind of system, right, Sharon? Yeah, that's a different system. We don't have a tenure system. Mm. Um, we Faculty are here on rolling contracts, so every year you get evaluated. If you meet expectations, you have an additional three years added to your contract. So we do go through the promotion process from assistant oh. associate to full, but no tenure is awarded. Really? So even as a full professor, you get this uh, rolling evaluation every year, right? Yes. Mm. So we write a um, professional development plan and that gets a, and a report at the end of the year and that gets evaluated by your supervisor and, and they're, um, oh. they, you know, basically it's, you know, they determine whether or not you meet or exceed or don't meet expectations. Goodness. It hasn't really been a problem for most faculty. I mean, it, it's, yeah, people leave here at some point for different reasons, but it's not because of tenure. I mean, there's, there's other things going on. Hmm. You come in knowing this, of course. So Yes, yes. We, we came in knowing that this was an experiment. It's the only um, school of the Florida University system that ha- doesn't have tenure. Got it. Hmm. Well, Kevin, this um, happens everywhere. It does. And uh, as Dixon and I said, we've, we've seen it often. It will persist. Uh, we asked Diane Griffin for her advice, yeah, right? Yeah, I did. I did. Tough I did. times, Dixon said. And she said, if you are passionate that's right just do it keep doing it. that's correct but if you and david baltimore said if you can think of doing anything else with your life <laughs> do that do that, that's do right. that. <laughs> good advice Ooh, i'm uh, sorry to be so uplifting kevin <laughs> <laughs> and that is twiv 454 no relation to 454 life sciences except uh that it was done we did parallel processing multiple <laughs> papers you can find Twiv at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash Twiv. You can send your questions and comments to Twiv at microbe.tv. And consider, if you like what we do, I should really say this at the top of the show, because by now, no one's listening. <laughs> no, <laughs> not true. If you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have different ways you can help out. Patreon account where you can give us a buck a month or you can buy swag, you can give us money on PayPal. Uh, anyway, uh, we would love to have your support. We would be eternally grateful. It, it allows Dixon to travel to Montana to uh, participate in that TWIF, for example. A lot of fun, right, too. Right, Dixon? Yep. Dixon de Pommier is at thelivingriver.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure to be back. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you, Thanks. Kathy. This was a lot of fun. This is so good. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Our guests today have been and are still from Florida Gulf Coast <laughs> University. <laughs> Sharon Eastern. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. And Scott Michael. Thanks a lot. Great to be here. Thanks. Good to have you back a second time. Uh, I don't know if you remembered it last time, but it went two hours just as it did today. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> like having you because I, when I went on to Skype, it tells you the length of your last conversation. I found you at two hours and four minutes. So we, I said, now nah, we're not going to go two hours today, and we did. We did. Anyway, thanks. So me. sorry. No, no, not at all. Not a problem. I enjoyed it oh, very much. Remember, this is edited afterwards. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I, yeah, take, right. A, I take a few minutes. Exactly off both ends. right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music at the beginning of TWIV is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week with another TWIV. Is viral. <laughs>